I, um, I did a tasting like this. It's probably been maybe like eight years ago now. Um, and I think it was actually Mr. Riedel himself that was doing it up at Mandavi and I did it. And uh, it was a pretty cool experience. I was like, all right, that was fun. That was cool. Like the whole glass thing. All right. But I, I wasn't like 100% convinced at the time. I was like, that was pretty fun. I'm definitely going to make sure I've got good glassware and everything. Uh, but it was pretty interesting to see. And then I, I enjoyed the experience so much. And it was so much fun. We did a great event um, in like 2013 or 14 at the Meritage and uh, invited Rito back. Um, and we did it at the hotel. We'd had probably about 50 people or something. We did it with our wines. And then I was like, oh my gosh, this is like insane how much different it is glass to glass. So this has been one of my favorite um, sort of wine education things to do uh, over the years. And I, uh, some of you, as we've talked about, we've done some impromptu ones uh, at the tasting room over the years too, which has been fun. Um, but I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, a couple housekeeping items. Um, everyone is uh, starting on, on mute. So um We'll definitely open it up later on, uh, but that's just to make sure we don't have any feedback on the audio or anything. Um, if you're new to Zoom, if you look on your menus, some of you it's going to be at the bottom, some of you it's at the top, uh, there is a chat function. So please feel free anytime during the tasting to use that if you want to throw out a question um, about the glass or the wine or what we're doing. Um, we can try and answer that uh, uh, live then um, or make sure we get to it at the end. Um, and then uh, hopefully everyone already has their wines uh, and glassware and everything set up. Um, and I'm trying to think, Ben, any other housekeeping items? I think that's. Yeah, the only other thing I can think of, there's also a raise hand function that you can use. So if you raise your hand, uh, either using the video camera or in the participant, uh, area, I can uh, unmute you if you have a question that you would like to ask. Great. So um, I'll introduce uh, our friend Anne from uh, Riedel, uh, and she's going to lead us through this tasting. Um, she's got a, a great presentation to teach you uh, a little bit about the science. Um, if you all are uh, dying to have a sip of wine, have a side glass. Don't mess up your setting yet. This is a little bit of a Simon Says game, so except it's Ann Says, so don't pour anything until Ann Says. If you have a, 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 side, a side beverage, that's all fine by me. Um, but Ann is uh, the Vice President of Hospitality for Riedel North America, so we're really uh, honored to have her. It's been great working with her um, and uh, her colleague Susan, who's our, our normal uh, awesome uh, local representative up in Napa that's been helping us out for years. Um, but with that, Anne, I guess I'll, I'll hand it over to you and uh, to tell us what we're doing here. Thanks, Garrett. That's a lovely introduction and uh, happy to be here in uh, a bit more of a casual setting. Uh, this is kind of my new normal, settling in, another Zoom tasting. And uh, if you've attended a Riedel seminar like Garrett has in the past, you know that we typically set you up with, like fifth grade students you know, classroom style, everybody facing me, Anne or George Riedel or some other ambassador for Riedel. And they are watching every single move that you make, making sure that you sip at the right time and do not touch the bowls, only the stem. I can't see what you're doing, um, only if we put it in gallery view, uh, which we're not gonna do. We're gonna show a little bit of a presentation. This is truly Anne says. So uh, because I can't tell what you're doing, and I can't truly play teacher, we're going to implement the buddy system. And the buddy system goes a little bit like when you were in camp and you were a kid and you had to go in pairs and watch the other person making sure they're not lost or jumping ahead. So do me a favor and implement the buddy system, whether you're in pairs or maybe there's, uh, you're violating uh, the social distancing guidelines and there's four of you or six of you in the room. Give me a, just do a little eye roll when you see somebody jumping ahead or, or not doing the proper stuff. But all joking aside, this is your tasting. This is what a Thursday night, we should be having fun. We have beautiful wines, beautiful glassware, a rich history, which I'm going to weave throughout my presentation. So I want you at the end of the day to be inspired, 
I hope educated, motivated, and uh, just excited overall about, about the future, the future of wine enjoyment and the future of our country and the future of health and everything. I'm ready to look into the future. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of over all of this and I, I just can't wait for a big bright end of uh, second half of 2020. So with that, I will uh, actually have my daughter now cue the presentation that I put together. Hopefully we don't bore you. It's uh, kind of going back in school with a bit of a PowerPoint presentation. So, excuse me here, if, if we go back to the very beginning. This so, is gonna be much better than homeschooling, Anne, so I don't think anyone's gonna be upset. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the interesting thing about all of this Zoom stuff is have you guys seen like everyone from Jimmy Fallon to Hoda and everything, everyone making apologies for their glitches and things like that. So we're not perfect, but uh, my daughter has become like the expert. She's 11 years old and she could, she probably has like her PhD equivalent in Zoom now. So she's running my transitions for me. Um, so just simply title page and uh, you probably know a little bit about Riedel Crystal. We are a family owned company, 11 generations strong, over 265 years in business. What all that means to us today is that we've spent the past three generations fully devoted, starting with Klaus Riedel, then George Riedel, one of my two bosses, and Maximilian Riedel, 11th generation. They have devoted all the time and energy um, that life provides them to improving wine enjoyment. They are so fanatical about what they do. Time Magazine a few years ago said this iconic Austrian clan, this family has done more to improve and change the wine industry than any single one winemaking family. And that's a huge testimony for what we do. We don't complicate things. Some say we're complicated. We have so many different stems. We will demystify that a little bit for you today, but there's a reason why, because the wine industry is a little bit complicated. Life would be so simple if we could just choose an all-purpose glass, right? Just pour everything into it. would be so easy. But what we really strive to do is optimize wine enjoyment according to the DNA and the style of each grape. Um, over 1,000 varieties just in Italy alone. We, start, we try to highlight the key noble varieties, and today we have the two uh, in front of us. We have Chardonnay and we have Cabernet. So incredible family-owned company. We've got lots of stories to tell, but without further ado, I am going to get you excited in case, you know, I heard we have some people from the East Coast. You probably already had a glass maybe or two of wine, and then we've got people on the West Coast who may have just come from the garden, you know, picking the last peas for the season. Um, so we want to get you in the mood. In case you're not in the mood, here's a sneak peek of our production of the performance series, which we're about to experience factory level. setting, similar to what a chef would do when he's about to prepare a meal with his knives and his cutting boards and all of his ingredients, we also need our ingredients. So we have the performance tasting set, which you are all delivered alongside the two wines. At the end of it, this is a little bit, the picture shows a little bit what your tasting set should look like, less the two wines. We have four glasses of different shapes and sizes, and then um, you can certainly pour from the bottle, but what I like to do is actually have a couple of plastic cups positioned and we'll go over that here momentarily. So it starts with the tasting mat, which was in the box. Um, and on the tasting mat, you have four circles, positions one, two, three, and four. 
And I want to make very sure that you positioned the right glass on the right little circle. Um, so there's a picture that matches the glass. On position number one, we have a pretty wide shaped bowl. Um, the widest rim diameter, if you just want to gaze down at your mat and make sure that the Chardonnay glass is on position number one. It is sort of a wide belly bowl, wide rim diameter. On position number two is the most narrow rim diameter. This is the ideal glass for Sauvignon Blanc and it is the most fluted in shape. On position number three, then we have a super sexy looking glass. This is for Pinot Noir, also pretty narrow rim diameter, and then has this little sort of additional tulip shape at the very top. And finally, on position number four, our most loved shape, this is for Cabernet Sauvignon, um, and this is probably the biggest bowl on the entire tasting mat. So now you should have the entire mise en place set up and ready to go. As Garrett mentioned, I, I think, you know, you can have a little spittoon off to the side. I have a super elegant one. It's a small solo cup, red solo cup. Um, and I also poured myself some water. Additionally, if you've got a little bit of time or a partner in the kitchen with you or wherever you may be, um, go ahead and pull like your benchmark glass. What, what compromise glass do you grab from the cabinet um, or your storage area when you don't have the ideal great variety specific Brito glass? It might be fun to compare as we go along what you experience in the different shapes of Riedel versus maybe a non-Riedel glass or a Riedel glass that you feel is perfect in what you've been using all along. All right, so next we have the featured wines for tonight. We have the 2015 Trinidad's uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, which Garrett will talk about in just a little bit. And we are going to be starting with the Chardonnay 2016 Trinitas. So excited to try these wines. I cheated a little bit earlier the week in the week and had some tastes um, of these wines. All right. So this is a sensory experience. Did you know that emotions are triggered by the senses? We will, I would like to trigger your senses from the sense of touch and sight and smell and taste all the way to the sense of sound. And we already engaged those senses a little bit earlier with the video and um, maybe you've cheated a little bit and already engaged your sense of taste. But the sense of sight is important because we eat with our eyes, we drink with our eyes. And as you gaze down at your tasting mat, you see that there are truly four different shaped glasses. And the sense of sight is relatively, we're pretty judgmental. We choose our partner, we choose what we like, we choose what we wear, and we choose even maybe what glass we like. We judge, we say we want the Cabernet glass because we like the shape, but does it serve a purpose? Is it correct functionality wise for the wine that we choose? So sense of sight is important. We'll talk a little bit more about that here soon, but sense of touch I like to, um, I like to bring up because do you, do you realize, I guess, that the entire human civilization would be threatened if it weren't for the sense of touch? We are so, so sensitive on the tips of our tongue, the tip of our fingertips, and probably one other zone of our body, of course. And that allows us to procreate. And without the high sensitivities, perhaps we wouldn't be able to uh, procreate as quickly and as effectively as we do. Um, the skin being the largest human organ, of course, we've got those sensitivities on the tip of our tongue, which are so important. The sense of smell is probably my most favorite. I refer to it as the superhero sense. We all are born with certain senses of smell and we create this beautiful library as we age. So when I talk about each of the wines and Garrett talks about the wines, we may taste and smell things different from what you do, but that is subject to our own set of experiences. Sense of taste is kind of boring actually. Um, four main uh, areas uh, are, are components to the sense of taste plus umami. And I always say if I didn't have the sense of smell, I would probably be about five pounds lighter because with a sense of taste, life is actually boring. We need the sense of smell and the, those two together to really enjoy wine. Sense of sound will engage a little bit later when we experience some decanter. So basic anatomy of the glass. Please approach glass two, this sort of fluted glass, which is perfect for Sauvignon Blanc, aromatic white wines. And I'd like for you, please, to approach the stem if there is a stem on a glass. Now, we create the O series, which is also um, unique to Riedel and that it's, it's all about really the bowl. So just let's break this down here. Please just take it by the, the stem. 
It starts with the bowl. The bowl is part of the architecture of the glass and truly the communicator of the message. It is so important. It's like a conveyor belt onto the palette. So this is where Rito really spends all of its time and energy to develop the perfect vessel for each wine. Then we have the stem. Now all of the Rito stems are very thin blown. In the case of the performance collection, we saw it's executed by machine and we have these beautiful elongated pulled stems. And I love it because um, if you turn the glass on its side, you don't do have to do this now, but you can probably see my glass. I can perfectly balance this on my two fingertips, almost like a Japanese sword. So this long, elegant stem is what connects the weight of the base to the weight of the bowl. By the time that you have wine in it, it's perfectly balanced. So that base, let me get to that here. So the base, sometimes people are annoyed because they can't turn the glass upside down and put it into their hanging wine glass racks. We don't do that to annoy you. It truly is for balance. And it's a great sign of a quality in a wine glass is the size of the base. The larger the base, the more difficult it is to produce the glass. Um, it's the longer cooling time. What is truly unique about the performance collection and why is Riedel continuing to create different and, and, and unique glasses? Is it all about the, um, is it durability? Is it elegance? What is it? Well, with Riedel, you always have a sheer rim. So in the case of the performance, we have a, once again that sheer rim. If you roll your fingers along the tip of the glass, you'll notice that it is very, very, very thin. And on the inside, you probably start to feel some ridges. What are those ridges? And as you turn it in your, in your fingers, you see almost like a chandelier effect. That is due to the optic interior of the glass. And we have that optic running on the inside only, notice, not on the outside. So this is truly unique production. We will tell you a little bit more about why we created Optic. It's not just for beauty. In fact, the beauty is so secondary. Riedel doesn't just make beautiful tools. They are tools for wine enjoyment, um, which should amplify your wine experience. All right, so let's get to tasting. I am going to show you a demo of the first wine, which is the Chardonnay, and I have not yet pre-portioned my wine yet, but I'm gonna pour four ounces. And if you do have a plastic cup, four ounces looks a little bit more than half. That was a pretty generous pour. Why do we pre-pour the wines? It's because by the time we move along in the tasting, um, don't want you to be over pouring. Uh, we really just need a few ounces in each of the glasses to be able to properly demonstrate. So we have a Chardonnay in the glass. And what I'd like for you to do first is go ahead and put all contents into glass one. So glass one is the one that we designed specifically for Chardonnay. Some may be asking right now, it doesn't look like a Chardonnay glass, it looks like a red wine bowl. Well, Chardonnay of this style with malolactic fermentation and barrel aging and alcohol of 14.3%, um, this is really textbook new world Chardonnay and we want to put it into a glass that will allow it to breathe and to open up. So please, Give glass one just a little bit of a swirl. Susan taught me to, um, she shared a little lesson on swirling, I love it. If you're not comfortable swirling in midair like this, just start on the table and when you're comfortable, you can kind of helicopter up. So I am going to helicopter up. Why are we swirling? It looks really cool, right? My kids swirl their chocolate milk, their orange juice, and I'm drinking far too much wine around them, I can tell. Um, but swirling does look pretty darn cool, but there is a function behind all of that swirling. We are coating the interior surface of the glass. Yes, we're, we are exposing the wine surface to air. We're doing all, all of those things, but what is aroma and what is scent, what is smell after all? It is simply aroma molecules lifting off the surface of the liquid. So it's evaporation. And what Regal tries to do is capture aroma in the bowl of the glass. Up until the 1950s, glasses were shaped very much like this. I pulled this from my, my mother's cabinet. This was her great aunt Harriet's collection. And this one happens to have a little adorned rim. It has a gold rim. But all of the glasses, beautiful, gorgeous, gorgeous stems, cut. But they did nothing to capture aroma molecules. If you have a glass like this at home, give it a try. You can also try it in your plastic cup. It flares and all the aroma does is just lift off the surface and float out into midair. 
So with glass one, as you swirl it, you're probably already starting to generate a little bit of aroma. Join me please in a first inhalation of this wine if you haven't already. And when you are smelling from the glass, please rest the rim of the glass on your upper lip, full body contact. And if you're wearing glasses, you should hear it clink to clink, glass to glass. Let's dive in. Starting to experience all those beautiful buttery notes, the richness, the slight butterscotch, and of course the lovely fruit. Now let's have a sip and then I'm going to turn it over to Garrett to give me some tasting notes on this lovely Chardonnay. So let's give it a swirl once again. Let's have a sip. Yeah, it's fun. <clears throat> um, so m many of you are probably very familiar with this since this is our most popular wine, but um, you know, you definitely, uh, you know, we're it's all aged in, in, in oak, predominantly American oak, a little, little bit of Russian oak and, um, uh, you know, aged for just under a year. And then you, know, you get the creaminess and the mouthfeel from both barrel fermentation. So it's fermented in that oak barrel. And then also, uh, the hundred percent malolactic fermentation, um, which, which creates that buttery texture, uh, creamy mid palate and, and soft finish. Um, but you know, it's always fun. You know, sometimes I, I take things for granted and I just drink my wine. Um, but it's fun now that we're in this kind of academic environment and this glass, like I, I actually, one of my kids is going to try to bring me I haven't done the uh, what's my benchmark glass, but I have some, uh, I have a Riedel Burgundian glass that I usually use for Chardonnay, but I'm already picking up different notes in this glass. And, um, you know, the, the, the barrel notes are, are very uh, pronounced, but also elegant. Um, and uh, it's also, um, you can just hand it to me. Thanks. Um, my off screen help. Uh, but the thing that I noticed the most uh, that's elevated for me is the citrus. There's like a, like this Meyer lemon thing going on, on the nose, um, which I sometimes get, but I just find it very heightened, uh, here, which is nice. See, now I gotta try it. I, this is my, my uh, typical, is this the, is this the restaurant? Do you recognize this, Anne? Is this the restaurant, uh, Burgundy or Susan? It, it's the Pinot Noir glass. And I love that yeah. you chose that because we're actually gonna, just, we're gonna start to move the wine around a little bit. Um, but I, I love that you chose a glass, not only that is not for Chardonnay, but also it's not optic. So back right. to the optic thing, um, the ridges inside each of the performance glasses. I was adds, curious what that was all about. Yeah, it, it adds the visual appeal, but what it does is it adds surface area. And the more surface area you have in a glass or on a surface, the more amplified aroma you will have. So if you stretch out the glass, all of these peaks and valleys and ridges, you're gonna have more surface area. This collection start out, started out as a commission from Krug Champagne. And they have, we have done some special glasses for them in the past. And with this particular one, they wanted something truly different, truly unique. And Maximilian Riedel was really challenged to come up with something bigger, uh, but not physically bigger. So he was literally designing and drawing out some ideas and started kind of like crumpling paper up, throwing it in the corner and was not satisfied with, with his ideas. And he's looking at this pile of crumpled paper. He's like, I just made something that was big, small again. Can I somehow achieve that in a glass? We didn't create optic. The Venetians have been doing it for many, many years. But to put it only inside a bowl like this, and an effort in a thin, blown glass to amplify aromas is truly where we're going with this collection. And if you taste it in a benchmark glass that's not optic, you'll probably have an aha moment. Having an aha moment right now. Awesome. <laughs> so in addition to that, I actually want to guide, guide the attendees through a little bit of kind of a comparative tasting. So we're going to use the same wine 
and we're going to put it into a different Riedel glass, performance glass. So please join me in putting all of the wine from glass one into glass two. This so is glass, the most technical part of the tasting. Yeah. The most technically sure, challenging. Yeah, we're all in glass two right now, the most fluted glass. Um, and keep in mind with glass one, the reason it was designed for Chardonnay is Chardonnay is relatively complex. Most white wines or a lot, many white wines don't see oak aging, but Chardonnay is just one of those varieties that we want to have oak. Oak is relatively expensive. Barrel aging is a tedious process. It takes time, energy, and money. And you want that flavor of oak to gently be integrated with the wine. So we created a larger bowl because of the higher alcohol level, the complexity of the wine, with the oak aging, all of those things. So I wanna show you what happens when we take this complex wine and put it into a glass with a more linear appeal of glass that is designed specifically for more aromatic white wines that don't see oak aging. So here we go, glass two by the stem. Let's give it a swirl. Let's give it an opportunity to breathe as well. Coating the interior surface, increasing evaporation space. And first let's smell. Smell the difference in what you smell in this glass versus in glass one. And if you forget what glass one brought forward, just go to the empty glass. I promise you, you will still have residual aroma. The buttery toasty notes are very much there. And glass two, it, it, it turns into a lighter style wine that it's almost like the volume got turned down. It's more muted, less aromatic overall. And I pick out, definitely, I, I know Garrett mentioned citrus fruits as well as orchard fruits in glass one. But here it's almost more citrus. Um, I would say also maybe a bit more yeast. But overall, just as like, I'd be guessing, what is this wine exactly? Especially if I didn't see the robe of the wine. The robe, of course, the color of the wine is indicating that it could be something a little bit aged, could be dessert wine, could also be Chardonnay with that sort of slightly goldenrod color. All right, let's have a taste now. Notice, first of all, how much further you had to lift your head back to receive the wine. There's two ways to consume liquid. That's gravity flow, such as in glass two, or under pressure, drinking through a straw, or even glass one, where you have to slightly suck the, the wine from the glass. So it's a different presentation onto the palate. Glass two, very linear, very front palate, and glass one, more mid palate. So, High sensitivities on the tip of my tongue right now. For me, it's all about the three T's. Temperature, texture, and finally taste. We interpret the wine when we drink from the glass in that specific order. Temperature, of course, first, because you know when you have a hot cup of coffee in the morning, it's like, is it too hot, is it not? So temperature is like that danger zone. Like We wanna make sure it's okay. Texturally, in glass one, creamy, rich mouthfeel. In glass two, we didn't change the wine, but we changed our perception and it became more leaner, um, less creamy, less rich, less opulent. And then taste. I always look for an imitation for a second sip. It's a lovely wine. And I now have had it in two glasses. Glass one gave me an imitation for another sip. Glass two what made me question if I really want a white wine or maybe this isn't the wine that I want right now. So. If you're an ABC drinker out there, anything but Chardonnay, perhaps you've been drinking out of a glass like this your entire life. And I would encourage you to consider a more wide rim glass, hopefully a Rito glass, and ideally in the performance collection. So we experienced the good in glass one, the not so good or the bad in glass two. Great wine, just less good experience. Are you ready for the ugly? All right. It gets, it gets worse. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, but then we'll go back and we'll repair our palate, I promise. So let's go into glass three. Um, and everybody loves to use glass three because it's just, it's really a sexy shape. Um, you can really swirl and not have to worry about wine popping out of the glass. You can be pretty aggressive with it. So let's give it a swirl. And the reason I bring this up is sommeliers around the world say, 
Uh, don't complicate my wine glass program. I want one burgundy glass. I want a Bordeaux, I want a you know, white wine glass, and then I just need one for burgundy. And I always look at them in this confused way. I'm like, but burgundy is two distinctly different things. So we have Chardonnay, we have Pinot Noir in burgundy. And the two are very, very different. Chardonnay wants acidity, it needs to have acidity so that it can be uh, long lasting and palatable and very balanced. Pinot Noir comes with medium to high levels of acidity already. You don't really want to bring more acidity to the wine. Therefore, glasses one and glass three, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay glasses, are shaped a little bit differently. You can see glass one is a derivative of glass three, but it's just cut shorter. Look at the rim diameter difference. I know you can't see it really here, but look down at your mat. Glass three is very, very, very narrow. So when you first smell from this glass, you're going to experience a different aroma profile. Definitely more yeast. I always get much more yeast, which is a lovely flavor contributor. We love yeast. We just don't want to smell all yeast and not have the beautiful kind of layered oak aromas and fruit. But that definitely is what I get first. Yeah, it's just like I get a, even a little bit of like funky, which is surprising. Yeah, it, it does get a little like funky, not horrible, but funky. Yeah. But, but the fruit is a little bit lost and muted. So when you sit for the first time from this glass, notice what your tongue does to receive it. It creates almost like a little reservoir, a little pool, and it collects. If you did not reach out and with your tongue grab the wine and receive it in that little pool and force your tongue down, you would have wine streaming down your face. Try it. And this is that ugly I was talking about, where we all have to grab a sip of water. In this crazy way, it really boosts acidity. It leaves the wine a little bit more cloying. You guys, this is a lovely wine. And I would drink this wine out of glass two and glass three. However, we just optimized it for you in glass one. So as quickly as we can, we're gonna go back into glass one with all the Chardonnay. Or you know what, if you said, and I don't, you know, I don't like a lot of oak on my wine. I prefer glass too. This is your party too. And from this day forward, all I ask you to do is judge your glassware before you dare judge these poor winemakers and their wines. Because maybe it's not their fault. Maybe it's a selection of glassware that's doing it for you and changing your impression. Those ABC. Give, giving, me, giving me cover here. Yeah, exactly. So glass one, a little swirl. Prepare the palate and please continue to sip and enjoy this wine. I'm going to take you for a sneak peek to our Coupe Shine factory where we produce, that's our headquarters, and we produce over 70 different kinds of decanters. to decant all wines, but for very different reasons. I've chosen one specifically to decant the Chardonnay. Uh, yes, we're gonna decant Chardonnay. We decant Champagne, Rosé, Sauvignon Blanc, all for different reasons. Different shapes and sizes allow us to put things that are, you know, should be cold or cool 
into the ice box or the refrigerator. Um, I'm choosing something a little larger and I selected the horn decanter because of this beautiful goldenrod color. It has this appropriate handle here, very convenient. And I love this because I display a lot of artwork and sculptures in my house. And this is hey. not just good for wine, but also good to display as well. Hey, so, Anne, do you, do you want to yeah. uh, stop sharing your screen so we can see the picture a little better of the sure. decanter? Yeah, absolutely. We've got um, another video to show you because this, this decanter actually has a dual purpose. So here you can see. Um, love the yellow. Yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. And I will just show you how I decant in it. Um, very simply, I love these are like show pieces for the table. You know, your guests will be absolutely wowed. And uh, even if you don't have guests and you're just at home with your significant other, your mate, whatever, why not bring out a decanter? It's a fun way to entertain. It's something a little bit different, it breaks up the monotony, and it pours just beautifully with this little handle. Those acoustics I was telling you about. So the other fun thing about this particular decanter, I told you I'd bring a sense of sound into play here, is this actually has a little bit of a mouthpiece. And you can actually fit certain mouthpieces inside of this. So here to tell you a little bit about the second purpose of this decanter is our 11th generation owner, Maximilian Riedel. We're here in Kufstein, Tirol, where I have invited my friends from Bavaria to introduce to you a wonderful, new and exciting decanter. It is our 2014 horn decanter, which we produce mouth-blown here in Kufstein. And it's uh, the first decanter that not only decants wine at its best, but you can even play some wonderful tunes. The real horn decanter. to be a pretty skilled musician. Uh, I can blow maybe two notes out of that. I played the trumpet for three years, but uh, that's all I got on that one, um, but a lot of fun. So we are ready to move on to the next line. Uh, at this point, we'd like to empty out all glasses. So however you make that happen is completely up to you. Uh, it's your wine. I'm going to put the Chardonnay into a little garage stall here, this clear plastic cup, leaving glass one empty. And I'm, seeing a, I'm seeing a couple of chuggers out there. They're making me proud, so it's good. <laughs> good. Yeah, depletions, right? All right, so we've got the Cabernet, and what I'd like to, for you to do first, I didn't pre-pour this, but um, please put about three to four ounces into glass four. And I'm pouring straight from the bottle. I did not have a chance to decant yet, because we're going to do a little demo with that here shortly. And again, this is our 2015 or your 2015 Trinitas Napa Valley Cabernet, which again, I, you can see that I was Coravin, doing the Coravin a little earlier in the week and my level has gone down to about here, Garrett, because it was go. so gummy, very elegant wine. You thiefed it. Yeah, <laughs> but I kept it preserved. All right, so in glass four, let's go ahead, give it a swirl increase that evaporation space. Beautiful color to this wine. And let's dive in for a first smell. And Garrett, I'm gonna turn it over to you to give some tasting notes before we start to move the wine. So if you wanna just take it away. Man, all right. Oh my God, well, the nose just jumps out of this glass. I'm excited, um, you know, this is our, our Napa cab. So we do um, a lot of great single vineyard cabs. Uh, and <clears throat> this is always fun because it's usually a portrait of the various different Napa Valley uh, Cabernet Sauvignons that, that we're uh, blessed to source from. Um, and then also some years, 
Uh, you'll get a little bit of Merlot in there, which I think we have in this vintage, and sometimes a little bit of Cab Franc. But um, the other thing, the reason why we picked this for the tasting um, is, A, I think it's good, you know, kind of showing the two uh, kind of classic Chardonnay and Cabernet, but this vintage is like probably one of my favorite vintages of the Napa Cab. And um, I really wanted to show this one in the Rito tasting because the flavors are so pronounced and so concentrated in this wine that, and I haven't uh, cheated and like gone ahead, but just the first glass, I'm already like really excited. I think it's going to pronounce um, the, the difference in glassware because it's such a rich uh, and amazing wine. So, you know, we aged this a little bit longer. It's about two years uh, in French oak. Um, so, so quite a bit of aging on that um, and, and, and quite a bit new oak, um, more than 50%. But, oh, man, you just get that just amazing chocolate, uh, just rich dark chocolate, uh, almost like a cherry, like with dark black cherries in it. Um, oh, those are just two things that really jump out at me here, but you get some really beautiful uh, uh, red fruits and blue fruits. And also, you know, as uh, Anne was alluding to earlier in terms of the five senses, I think that the, uh, uh, the color on this wine is, is amazing. Um, and yeah, I just love it. So I'm excited to see what the glassware does with it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, in addition to all of those tasting notes, kind of going back to the three T's, the temperature, the texture, the taste. So if you did your homework and, you know, read through all the directions of what you're supposed to do to prep for the tasting, this is a little bit like homeschooling, right? Uh, so you probably chilled your wine a little bit. And by now, and everyone's going, no, I don't want to chill my red wine. I don't want to put it in the refrigerator. Typically in tastings, we actually ask you to ice them down because by the time we get to talking about the Cabernet, it will have warmed up in a room temperature room uh, quite a bit. And it's then at the perfect temperature. Room temperature in the United States is, you know, 70, 68 to 72 degrees. So that's far too warm to consume red wine. So we want to chill it down just a little bit. If it's too warm, it tends to promote a little bit too much alcohol. So, but the temperature, perfect. The texture, it's like, it's very soft. I think it's drinking really lovely right now because it's just got these supple, soft tannins. And maybe you tasted this earlier in a different glass. Um, we're about to do that right now. But for me, what I love about this wine in glass four is the supple, soft, velvety tannins. And we affectionately call glass four our tannin tamer because it even takes some wines younger than this and starts to soften the tannins. Tannins exist in most vegetables and nuts, of course. It allows red wines to age and be structured um, you know, for so long. But when a wine is too tannic, it's not as enjoyable and it's difficult to find the fruit and some people just despise tannin. So decanting can help to reduce tannins. Thyme can help to reduce tannins, but we're all impatient, we don't have enough time. And the proper choice, choice of glassware can do that as well. So what we're going to do is actually move the perception of tannin from all around our palate in glass four to different parts of our palate. So please join me in equally distributing your four ounces, three, four ounces into glass two and glass three. We're going to examine the wine aromatically at the same time and then eventually taste wise. So let's start with glass two. This almost looks like one of those, you know, winery winemaker lab glasses, something that winemakers would use, right, Susan, to kind of analyze wine and use in the winemaking process to really find all of those little nuances. So let's see how it does for the Cabernet. Very, very quiet, very linear. There's incredible focus, but it's a little difficult to find the aroma. It's not as big. It's not as in your face. It takes a lot more thinking. I'm getting, I'm getting even a almost, which I never get on this wine. I'm getting some of the herbaceous kind of greener notes too. Totally. Yeah. Which, I, I which you know, is, you know, is not un, 
uncommon in, in some vintages, but this wine, I never get that on. So it's interesting. It just brings out that green kind of bitterness. And for me, the fruit, the fruit that's there went really, really, really dark, really black currants, very blueberry. And then I don't get oak. I, I, I just, I'm not finding really any oak. Before we taste, let's just remember what that was. Let's go to glass three, which we didn't love for Chardonnay. Let's see how it does for Cabernet. I promise you it does really well for Pinot Noir and for Barolo and anything from Nebbiolo and also Rosé Champagne. But let's see how it does. The next tasting. Hmm. So I wouldn't say it's as quiet as glass two. It's definitely bigger on the nose but i get i get alcohol i get green notes again um and i get definitely boosted alcohol which is not necessarily yeah just at the very end there you get that little sting in your nostril of the right. and this wine isn't shy but you know it's 15 7 but like on first on glass four you didn't it wasn't even noticeable right um, it just, it smells a little less structured in this glass. It smells like an acts a little bit more, almost like Syrah or, or one of those might maybe overly extracted Pinot Noirs or the Pinot Noir slash Syrah. Um, but there's a, still only a slight indication of, that it might be Cabernet. So let's go back to glass two and let's taste now. First, remind yourself of the aroma. And now let's taste. Notice initial contact point. Um, and if you spit or swirl or do all of these things, you could stand in your head, it wouldn't matter. It's the initial contact point, which is longest lasting on your palate. So pay attention to that. Notice the dry spot, the tannin, where it approached the tip of your tongue, but where you're left with the dry spot is actually more to the back part of your palate. It's not evenly distributed throughout. So it, it causes the wine to seem less in balance. Yeah, and it get, you get like almost no fruit at all on right. the palate. I, I do still get some of the chocolate a little bit, um, and then some more of the oak notes come out, some more like toasty kind of smoky notes from the barrel, but like the fruit is completely gone. And then right. the finish isn't like overwhelmingly harsh, but it's definitely, uh, it's very short. The, the fin I mean, it's like at the end, you're like, where did it go? I just have a little bit of tannin left on my tongue. Um, but it, it is bitter. It's not like aggressive tannins, but it's pronounced. Right. It's, and it creates kind of like that talk, chalky texture. I almost get like uh, squeaky teeth. I don't know if you guys, maybe it's just a, like a Midwestern thing, but like, I feel like my teeth could squeak right now because there's a little bit of like that chalky residue. Yeah. Um, somebody just commented they might be getting squeaky teeth too. So um, let's get rid of the squeaky teeth. Maybe in glass three, we will experience tannin in a different way. Okay. Remind yourself of the aroma. The aroma. Mm. Different, and now let's taste. Mm. The the bitterness is I like couldn't even tell you what the flavors are because the bitterness is almost overwhelming for me. Yeah. That's just the first note is it's tannin, tannin, tannin. And if you like, you could breathe fire right now because there's quite pronounced alcohol. Definitely. And I would say the tannin spot now moved for me even further back, creating yeah. the sensation to like want to grab for a glass of water. And more um, pronounced. Yeah. So as quickly as we possibly can. <laughs> Let's consolidate the wines into the correction glass, which is glass four. And Garrett, I noticed, noticed you have one of those big bad boys there, the, the double or the, yep. wine and the I had another aha glass. moment. And uh, it might be kind of fun to play a little bit with that. Oh, you're already there. Like, yeah, so, so this is like, this one's the, the Bordeaux XL Bordeaux. or 
Yeah, Excel Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. this is a fun glass. If you've been to our taste room and done one of the um, private tastings, we have uh, um, one of the really nice Riedel sets that Susan hooked us up with. Um, so we do all varietal specific um, glassware and everything. And this is like my go-to glass. I drink out of this every day because um, it fits more than a bottle of wine in it. Um, I know that you don't believe me, but I tested it. It actually works. Um, and I had to drink the wine, so I'm not going to dump it out. But this is like my favorite glass. And the cab tastes great in this glass. That's what I normally drink it out of. And I haven't tasted side by side yet. But what I will tell you is smelling this, it's like, oh, this wine's delicious. And then I smell this. And it's like someone put a loudspeaker over this glass for the, for the, uh, for the smell. Like it's a lot of the same notes, but it's just more in your face. I mean, is that like what you're, what you should expect and between these two? Yeah, it's, um, you described it perfectly. It's almost like the Bose sound system, or I know there's higher levels of acoustics out there, but I'm going to, I'm going to just draw, uh, draw comparison to Bose. It's like you hear every note and the detail of every note. And if you are allowed to do that in a glass on a, if you drink wine like me on a daily basis, why not drink the better wine? And uh, performance for me is, is that um, it's just that one little more detail. And yeah, you just turn up the volume. You totally turn up the volume. It's we we refer to it as the ultimate loudspeaker for fine wine. And and is that I mean like the main other than the size, which I know is like not as important, but is it is it just the optical part on the inside that's really doing that for oh. the nose? So with performance, we, we continue, we stay true to uh, what we do. And in the bowl, we took parts and pieces from what we knew already. And it's the size, the shape, the rim diameter of the bowl that's truly the communicator of the message. We then right. took it. So all of these glasses are studied. There's so much to tell you. It's, it's hard to do it in an hour. Honestly, I think we need to do this again because we develop our glasses through a workshop process. It's not just Riedel saying, oh, we like this shape or we're going to, we think this is great for Pinot Noir. The original glass of glass three was developed by Oregon wine producers and George Riedel, the architect of the glass in 2005. He came together with 30 producers and after three workshops testing their wines in various different shapes, they came upon a shape very similar to glass three. So that bowl shape is so studied and with performance now we're just taking some of those shapes and that knowledge that we had from so many years of doing this with with the trade and added the optic that additional surface area because again without the sense of smell life would be kind of boring because we just smell or we just taste poor things so it's that retro nasal ortho nasal, nasal experience of smelling and tasting at the same time that really our taste buds. Yeah. So I'm going to decant this wine. I think probably now is a good time to, to move into, into that. If, Let's unless do it. Okay, perfect. And then I, I think we're going to open it up and take some questions. I'm happy to stand for a few minutes longer and, and do that. Um, so I have chosen specifically a, so I've got like a little bar cart back here of some fun decanters and I'm going to choose something I've got, let's see here, such fun little toys here. So I have Eve. I don't know if you know about Eve and the story of Eve. I've got one that's clear, but this one's a little bit more fun because it has color. I'm a color person. Um, so Eve, I just used it the other night. And before you ask the question about how to clean these, um, I use this so many times and it still just has a tiny bit of water in it. No big deal because I rinsed it out. Um, but I, and it, it stays clean because I just continue to rinse it with water. So the story of Eve and the reason why I'm using Eve is it's a development of uh, Maximilian Riedel. So 11th generation, he's one of the designers, CEO of the company. He's born in the year of the snake. So it has a little bit of a serpentine sort of feel to it. He's also a huge car guy. 
loves, you know, Ferraris and Lamborghinis and mm -hmm. everything. So it's kind of got this like turbine look to it. Um, he was coming about in the company when he designed this decanter in 2003. And he approached his father with it. Um, he produced this with some glass blowers in the factory. And George Riedel was impressed with the shape and size, his father. But he's like, well, does it work? Because we're all about functionality. So they went deep into the cellar, cellar and found a bottle of Trinitas Cabernet, uh, poured it into the neck of the snake, and it eventually found its way into the belly. Really fun to show this off. You can see I'm holding it kind of by the handle, or not quite the tail, but just oh, just ahead of the tail. Um, and you've got the wine in this lower chamber. So what they didn't realize is that initially is that they had produced a decanter that has some complications to it. It has two chambers because if you go to pour this as is, nothing will come out. You actually have to charge the decanter, and this is where the acoustics come into play again. Hopefully wow. you guys can hear that. By yeah, turning totally. it, just about a half turn, I do a couple of things. I push oxygen into the wine, and for young wines, this is so ideal. You're releasing that dormant CO2, so eventually if you continue to do that, you've got like a little foam cap of bubbles. That's good, it's not so is the dormant CO2, which also allows the wine to age. So I preloaded this perfect pour into the second chamber of the decanter. And this is about three, four ounces. And then you just go ahead and give it a little bit of a pour. We actually asked Rutgers University to do a study on this decanter and they were able to prove that it decants wine 13 times faster than one of our more still format decanters, such as the Macan. So works really, really well. It's fun. And what I love about this right now is, Lucy, are you my demonstration? My daughter. This is our, she is only 11 and definitely not able to drink right now, outside of a taste and maybe a fingertip. It's our social distance decanter. <laughs> So I just want to close my segment here with a fun little video. I met, um, met some along, someone along the way from the music industry, a uh, rapper named Two Chains from Atlanta. Anybody from Georgia tonight? I don't think I saw that on the list. But yeah, anyway, you know, we, got the, we, got, we got the Spaldings and Crocuses. Uh, They're all from Georgia. So uh, Two Chains, you may know, has a show on Viceland called The Most Expensivest. At, I didn't know exactly what, was, what it was all about. Uh, but I looked into it because I wanted to see what I was about to sign up for. And I was a little hesitant, but the company said, hey, why not? You know, nice to have kind of venture out into audiences. Maybe we don't typically, you know, the, the music industry and stuff that we don't typically get to. So we filmed a little segment at Harlan Estate about, I don't know, a little more than a year ago. And he fell in love with the canters. So here is me in two chains doing our thing. Two chains. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you two chains? All right, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Riedel Crystal is the company. Can I show you these glasses? Definitely, I want to Perfect. see Perfect, so this is the Burgundy Brown Crew glass. It's genius. It takes it to a whole new level. More alcohol. This is for the big parties. We create tools that are loudspeakers for wine. Ready for sound? Yeah. This is this is like the bomb diggity to canter. Hey. Yeah. We're trying to direct the flow intentionally to the front part of our palate. True. Breathe. This. Now put it to your ear. I know you like Cabernet, so this is a perfect to canter. I'm a Cabernet. I knew we could do it. Go air. All right, so that was two chains. Lastly, I just wanted to give you a little tutorial on how to properly toast with Rito glasses. Um, so 
if you are, and this is this picture doesn't exactly depict what you should do, but I'm going to take you through what you should do. And Lucy, I'm going to need your assistance once again. Um, so again, holding it by the stem, belly to belly, bowl to bowl is where you want to plank the glasses. Uh, here's to your health, happiness, and uh, from my office to your living room or wherever you happen to be, may you always drink the better wine. Thank you so much. You can bring that beautiful bell tone to your ear, and it's, it's so lovely. Thank you, Garrett, for hosting me. I hope we oh, can yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Anne and uh, and Susan and everyone from Riedel for partnering with us. This is super fun. Um, it's always awesome when I feel like I learned something. I've done this, I don't know, I've probably done this a few times. And then Susan has even done a few private ones for us. And now I'm like, my wife's not going to be happy that I got to buy some more of these performance ones. Cause I was like, well, Betsy, but it's like putting a loudspeaker on the ones that we already have. So that's going to be trouble. But, um, we got a couple, uh, great questions that you're more qualified to answer. Um, if you're open to answering a couple questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. this hasn't pulled up right now, but if you, Ben or Jared, if you just yeah, so, so yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll shoot them off to you. So, um, so Woody and Scott said, okay, so which wines will benefit from the Pinot glass besides Pinot? Anything from the Nebbiolo grape. So Barbaresco, Barolo, Nebbiolo, uh, Champagne. And I like to play with Grenache in this glass as well. So you're looking for a sort of some of that spectrum of lighter red wines. Um, but just, it, it puts acidity in check. So it focuses to the very front part of your palate it minimizes acidity. So think about those red wines that sometimes you, you taste and you're like, ooh, that's too acidic for me. I, I don't like it so much. You can certainly try it in glass three. But we definitely recommend Pinot Noir and Nebbiolo. And if then, you're ever confused yeah. and don't know, and you've got a collection and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to put in it, or you pull something from your cellar like Sherebe or Morved or uh, since so or something kind of crazy like that, go to the Riedel.com site and just go to our directory and we can guide you exactly to what glass we would recommend for that variety. And then um, the another question was, okay, amazing demonstration of how the glasses impact wine. I'm truly amazed. This is from, from LaShawn. And, um, uh, but with such swings in the wine, from glass to glass, how does this impact food pairing? Seems like the glass type needs to be taken into consideration for pairing. So I guess, how does the shape of the glass, how is it impacted by food pairing or, or is it, or what's the story there? LaShawn, that's like the most amazing, I love you for that question. And it gives reason to do this again, because typically, and I should rejoicing, I love this. So typically we do this with chocolate because we can't consistently provide a food pairing in a tasting setting to demonstrate, you know, food and, and wine and glassware and everything, but it's crazy. So we've partnered with Lindt Chocolate, and for the past four years, we've been pairing their chocolate, different types, with our wine in different glasses. So there's actually a third part to this tasting. Not only would we potentially add more wines, but we would add chocolates to show the difference of same wine, same chocolate, different glass, it's mind blowing. And we, t we do this demonstration very often for restaurateurs and F&B managers around the world because they spend so much time behind, you know, back of the house doing farm to table and the Psalm is doing a 500 bottle list and everything and all these beautiful nuances are brought together potentially in the wrong choice of glass. So all that to say, when you, sit down to enjoy your next meal, whether that's tonight or tomorrow night or whatever. Let's say it's a piece of salmon and you're having a Pinot Noir. Do me a favor and select two performance glasses or three or whatever, whatever you have time for. One that we would recommend for that variety and one we wouldn't recommend for that variety. Taste and compare the difference with that solid food contributor, the salmon, Pinot Noir in the two different glasses. It will blow your mind. It's a make or break situation. But 
only if you have the food there do you have the chance to really experience the contrast. And experience the contrast. Um, otherwise, I mean, if we're sitting at a restaurant, we just take it and we like it. And I, I take this opportunity to tell you, please demand better glassware. Doesn't have to be readable. But when we are out dining at restaurants, our entire team says, okay, well, what do they have for glassware? Do they have Riedel? If they have Riedel or don't have Riedel, what is the shape? If they have a shape like this, chances are we're probably gonna choose a Chardonnay off the list. If they have a shape like this or worse like this, we're probably gonna have a cocktail or drink a beer because wine may not be in our, in our future there. A little cheater too, if you do like Chardonnay, um, and you don't, the restaurant doesn't have a Chardonnay glass or you don't want to have, don't have one friendly or handy next to you. The Cabernet glass does a pretty good job. It does a far better job than glass two or three. But oftentimes restaurants do not have a Chardonnay, Oak Chardonnay specific glass. So choose, no. choose the Cabernet. They might bring you Pinot Noir because they think it's Burgundy, but take the Chardonnay. Sorry for the long answer on that, but I get really That's good. No, you know what drives me really insane? And I've gotten into, it, I won't call them arguments, but I'll call them discussions. <laughs> and I don't want to like pull my card, you know, but I'm at a place and it's a sommelier serving us and they bring out a glass like this, you know, or they've got, you know, like a glorified water glass for a wine glass and they bring out this glass for my Cabernet, I go, no, 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 no. Just bring back that other glass you had. And they go, oh, no, sir, this is our fine red wine glasses. Like, I'm a sommelier. And I just go, oh, God, do I? And I was like, it's like one of those awkward things because I'm like, I know you're wrong. And I could be like, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a vintner, but then they'll never like my wine again. So I get into these, like, arguments with these guys at the restaurant. So but that's the most common thing. They bring this glass out or something like it because it's got the bigger bowl and they, that's like their fine red wine glass. It drives me nuts. So you all on the call can, I mean, maybe you were a skeptic coming into this tasting. Uh, maybe you're st still, still a skeptic. I hope not. Um, you either believe it or you don't and you have to just trust your senses. Maybe some of you are evangelists and you can help us on this crusade for better glasses on friends. And um, if your best friend or favorite restaurant doesn't have Riedel, you have now an opportunity to like almost like a soldier go in there with your little wine kit and you have four wine tools here that would fit any of the wines you could choose on the list uh, with very very few exceptions um, and I would say that this is now you know it's a, it's a great opportunity and uh, don't judge the wine judge the glass first, make sure it's clean and appropriate. For the wine that you're about to invest in, whether that's $50 or $200, you deserve a better glass. So, so one of my favorite questions on here, and I'm, I'm very curious the answer to this, is will these glasses make lesser wines taste better or more lesser? Yeah, we're not going to change, we're not magicians. We're not going to improve the wine. Uh, if there are flaws within the wine, they will be amplified in the glass. But it can, it can help to uh, augment flavors of wine that are good and are there, that you might not discover in a wine that is, or in a glass that is inferior. But we can't do miracles. Yeah, which sparked John Lanher, good point, says BYOG. Bring your own glass. Love it. Do you then, do that, Anne, when you go to a restaurant? Uh, it depends. I kind of walk the fine line like you do. Like, ooh. I, I sometimes take it as an opportunity. Like, if I take some glasses as a gift, because I'm selling, selling the glassware as well, I can do a little demonstration and just leave the gift behind. Um, can you go get my ultra bill? It's in my closet there. So I, I travel with a little companion. It's called the O to go. So my daughter's going to grab it. It's actually our Riesling glass, non-optic, that's put into a little canister. And we have two shapes. We have one for Cabernet, which is our best-selling glass. You still have to compromise a little bit, but at least it's, it's something. So this is O to go. 
Oh and yeah. The best gift you'll ever give yourself or others. I keep them in my gift closet all the time. Um, so this goes in my suitcase or my briefcase. And this just has this little O collection glass. This is Riesling. And it's a really good all-purpose glass. So I love it for staying in hotel rooms because first of all, I don't trust the cleanliness of the glass that they offer me. And lately it's been rocks glass. I'm like, why are they, there's no wine glass in the room. There's just rocks glasses. And they expect me to drink wine from it. So I've got my little O to go. It's about 17, 1750. There's a promotion going on regal.com right now. I think we're at about, it's like a 30% discount on all sales. So you can go and fill your shopping cart with O to go Riesling or white wine and O to go Cabernet. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, well, awesome. So, uh, and Susan, you and I see Susan's been out there on the chat, uh, answering a lot of questions on the side, which is awesome. Um, this has been super fun. So we would love to do this again. We we've kind of toyed with the idea of using the same set, but next time doing Sauvignon Blanc and our uh, estate Pinot which might be fun. So we'll get back with everybody. Um, so if you're already on this tasting, you can use uh, the glasses you have. And then uh, we'll have some more folks that want to do uh, buy some of the glass where we are. We had, we, we didn't know um, how popular this was going to be. So we only got a hundred sets from Rito, but we sold out in like two and a half days. So thanks to everybody on here who was uh, awesome fans uh, of our wines and their glassware but we'll uh, give some more time that we can reorder more next time that we do it. But um, hopefully, uh, hopefully we can do one soon. That'd be a lot of fun. Absolutely. I am, uh, I'll be home and I'm, I've never been more available. So <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of my new thing. I typically travel about 50% of the time, but I'm home quite a bit. So just let me know. Look forward to seeing all of you guys again soon. I love the gallery view to see everybody in their homes. Um, appreciate it so much. So thanks again. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, and we'll, we'll let you go. I know it's late there in the Dakotas, but uh, thanks for joining everyone else. If you want to stay on and, and chat for a little bit, I'd love to hear uh, some of the feedback. We got some of the great stuff in the chat, but thank you, Anne and, and the real team. We appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Guys. We got it here. I'll clink myself. Okay. Yeah. And to Ann, Ann Jr., what's your name? Okay. Where you get your Lucy. Name? <laughs> Lucy. Lucy? Yeah. Thanks, thanks for running the show for us, our producer in the background. She makes bucks for every Zoom tasting she does. <laughs> oh, there you go. I was going to say, I, could, I, I like to pay people in wine, but not yet, Lucy, a few years. Not yet. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks Ann and Lucy. Bye. So,